Well, hello all. Uh, this, uh, my name is Jeff Ballantyne. I, as Michelle said, I am a hydraulic engineer in the river, hydrologic and river engineering section at the Portland District Corps of Engineers. I am a professional engineer in the state of Oregon. Um, I've had that registration since 2012. And the title picture here on your right is uh, Nature's Hydraulic Engineers, Beavers. Um, they have a, a lot of influence out there uh, in wetlands and how uh, our, uh, the natural habitat is shaped here in the Pacific Northwest and across North America. So a little bit about me. Uh, I am from Eugene. I currently live in Portland, and I went to school at, in, Oregon, in Corvallis at Oregon State University. I graduated uh, with a degree, bachelor's degree in civil engineering in 2007, and I got my EIT certification upon uh, graduation at Oregon State. Uh, I often get asked, uh, well, why didn't you go to U of O? Train the ducks like that. I grew up in Eugene, after all. Um, and the answer is, well, uh, Oregon State has engineering and U of O doesn't. Um, that's really the answer. And I, I, uh, people are somewhat dissatisfied with my betrayal of my, my hometown school. Uh, but that's the answer. I joined the Corps in 2009. I went through the EI2 program, which uh, there will be, I believe it's later, Michelle, there's a uh, presentation on what that entails, correct? Oh yeah, Eileen, our EIT coordinator is going to talk about the opportunities um, that are available for young people at the Corps, including the EIT program. Great. Um, Briefly, I mean, I went through it and I can tell you my experience with it was great. It gives you experience across uh, the Portland district. If you come to the Portland district or on some cases across the core, you can get details across the nation if, if uh, they are available at that time. And so it gives you a broad experience on what uh, the core does and the various missions. And it also makes, uh, helps you make connections to various people in the core so that you can uh, call on the right people when you need their help later. Because engineering is a collaborative experience. So you're going to need those help. You're going to need that help. Um, and on that note, um, the core is a great place to work because we get to work on the largest and most complex projects in the region. Engineering is, is a collaborative effort between people with different types of knowledge and different areas of expertise. And uh, the core does the biggest projects that we that we have around here. So on that note, uh, the Corps operates um, 13 dams in the Willamette Valley. Um, you see there in the picture, uh, this is kind of a cartoon graphic of the Willamette River Basin. Uh, so the big ones are like Detroit and Lookout Point down south of Eugene and Detroit, as it is. Um, east of Salem on the San Diego River. So we also have what is called uh, Section 7 authority. We can operate dams that we don't own in times of emergency, flooding, or if there's some sort of uh, uh, need that the owner has uh, for us to take over operations. Uh, in this case, uh, the dam of interest is Scoggins Dam, uh, which controls Hag Lake on the Tualatin River. And I've put an arrow in the right, uh, excuse me, on the left side, uh, kind of where it is in the basin. It's a relatively small dam as far as the core is concerned, but um, as far, um, it's a pretty big dam if you're standing by it. It's, uh, and there's a lot of recreation out there, and it's used for to supply water to the Tualatin River, so for drinking water uh, during the summer, for instance. So why do we operate dams? Uh, you can see 
Dams and reservoirs generally operate to reduce the peak of flow um, in the downstream watershed. So if you look at the left here, you have a very steep hydrograph and then a, a wider uh, hydrograph that doesn't peak as high. This also reduces the downstream inundation, reduces flooding and uh, how high the water gets in the river and the floodplain around the river. Uh, and we build models, uh, computer models, to show what we, done, we, we have done with the dam operations and attempt to predict what we can do with dam operations in a hypothetical or forecasted flood. So this is a Tualatin River Basin. Uh, it is mostly in Washington County and takes up most of Washington County, uh, west of Portland. Uh, the dark blue there is the Tualatin River and the lighter blue are smaller tributaries that come into it. Uh, the arrow points out where Hag Lake and Scoggins Dam are there. Again, we built this model so that the core could have a better understanding of how we should operate the dam if there is a flood coming. Uh, the Tualatin River ends just above Lamont Falls in and empties into the Lamont River. It's a fairly, it's a medium-sized basin as far as the Lamont Basin is concerned. Um, but it doesn't, it, it uh, Water coming out of the Tualatin doesn't have a big effect on flooding in, say, Portland. It's mostly going to impact Hillsborough and Beaverton, the basin you see here. So how do we predict the flow coming into these models? Well, first we take river gauges. Uh, these are run by the USGS, the Oregon Water Resources Department, some other, some private entities, some other public agencies. They are spread all throughout the basin. This is a map of the location of the river gauges in the Tualatin River Basin. Uh, you can see there are a fair number of them and they collect data on the amount of flow in each stream. Uh, you can see an example on the lower right there of what a storm looks like. That's December, 2007, uh, basically downstream uh, near downstream in the Tualatin River Basin, kind of near West Lynn, in fact. We also take information uh, and have information from flood maps and historic floods. So this is a map of the Tualatin River Valley as it is thought to have flooded in February of 1996. That was a big flood, um, a, re a fairly recent big flood. It's getting further in the past now, <laughs> um, but uh, it's generally the flood that we use to use to um, show that our models uh, have are reproducing the the floods that we have seen in the past. And it's recent enough that people, some people remember this flood. Um, I was uh, in middle school in Eugene when this flood happened. Uh, and I remember Eugene being somewhat flooded. It was, it was a much bigger deal up here in Portland than it was in Eugene, but be that as it may. So uh, this is the lower part of the Tualatin Basin. Uh, and I want you to look at the shape that I have circled there and just kind of memorize that shape for a second. You can see the meanders and how it cuts back on itself several times. It has like a U shape in the middle there. Um, I'm gonna talk about this area for a little while. The middle part of this is fairly rural. Uh, and so there's not a lot of information about it. Something like the depth of the water under normal flow conditions the how the the bridges are constructed and the relative amount of plant life under or trees under the bridges now there's much more information in the areas around where people live kind of 
above this in Hillsboro and in the lower part of this reach in Tualatin because people live there and they have an interest in, say, surveying the river in that area. But in the middle part, there's not much information. So to build this model, I need to collect information. I need to figure out what sort of depth the water exists, what the plant life on the banks look like, that sort of stuff. Um, so I need a way to get there. And so, well, if you look back at that, if you remember back to that shape, you can see some of those same shapes in this map. Now, this is from the Tualatin uh, Valley Watershed Council, and they have a, they have mapped out a series of boat ramps, uh, mostly for non-powered boats. And you can go have a pleasant day on the Tualatin River. And this map kind of shows you where to go to do it. So to go collect the information that I needed, well, kayak trip time. I decided to take out my kayak and put it in at Farmington Road and kayak down to Tualatin. It was a fun day. It was a nice October day. It was nice, one of those crisp autumn days that we get here in Oregon. I really enjoyed it. So took a few measurements of depth of water, took some pictures, took some pictures of the bridges you can see on the right. It was a great day and I got a lot of information out. I got a feel for the river. It's one of those things we have to know when we're building these models. So back to this. So back to the Tualatin River, uh, the complete basin. You can kind of see what it looks like there. You can see we have we have information that I collected, information from other sources, and this is how I translated this map and all the information I collected into a river model. So this is a combination of one-dimensional and two-dimensional flow. Uh, what does one-dimensional mean? Well, one-dimensional flow means that you can approximate how the river flows in one dimension by assuming that all of the flow is traveling in one direction. Now, it's not a perfect model, um, but it does a pretty good job in most cases. Two-dimensional means that, you're in a, that you remove the depth variation from the model and you just concentrate on how water moves in, in the plane across, across the floodplain, say. So this includes the river channel, usually one-dimensional flow, because most, most river channels are approximately one-dimensional. The floodplain, a lot of two-dimensional flow, and we'll get to that, and the bridges and other aspects that control flow in the river. So the background here is a digital elevation model constructed out of LIDAR. Uh, LIDAR is I don't, I forget the acronym off the top of my head, but it's a laser on a plane that scans the ground and tells you how high the, how high uh, your, basically builds a model of the terrain. Uh, you can see on the left, that is Hag Lake. You can see it's kind of flat there. And zooming in, you can actually see the dam itself with the lake behind it. Um, Michelle very helpfully uh, uh, pointed out that LIDAR is light, <laughs> uh, light detection and ranging. I would not have come up with that. Thank you, Michelle. Um, that is the dam. And you can see it's a pretty big dam if you're standing by it, uh, if you're standing just next to it. And you can drive across it. It's a, it's a good place to go boating in the summer as well. I'm sure some of you know that. Uh, looking at aspects of the model, we're going to go down here to where I have the arrow uh, and point out a few aspects of how the model is constructed. So this is what a cross section looks like in the model. And that's all those green hashes that you see. Uh, you have the channel in kind of the, low, the lower bit there. 
Uh, you have the floodplain around the channel where water spills over once the channel fills up. Then you have upland somewhere above the floodplain that only rarely gets wet, if all, if at all. And then you have like a hill on the lower bit or the right side of the channel there. And that's never going to get flooded, uh, barring some like, catastrophic event. So you have a bunch of these cross sections throughout the river system. They uh, form a model and you use a backwater calculation to, uh, to project stages from the flow inputs that we got from the gate river gauges I talked about a little bit ago. So bridges are an important part of hydraulic models. They affect the flow in the channel and in the overbank. And that kayak trip was an important part of me putting together what the bridges looked like in this model. So uh, I have two pictures here, both taken from my kayak on the left and the right. And you can see that I have constructed the, excuse me, the bridge from those photos. So you can see the left pier there, that column, is kind of halfway up the bank. It's kind of sitting out of the water in the picture uh, on the left. And whereas the right one is sitting in the water and it's basically constantly flooded in the channel. And you can kind of see those two piers that I have uh, on the picture of that model representation of this bridge. So with the left pier out of the water, and then, but still kind of close to the bank, and then the right pier just constantly flooded down the channel. And I would have not have known that had I not gone out and and taken my kayak because I couldn't find pictures of it otherwise. So here we are. With the 2D areas, this is where you don't, you can't quite delineate the flow. It doesn't present itself in like a channelized form. So you have to use a 2D uh, mesh, it's called, with a series of cells to delineate how the flow moves through the channel, um, or excuse me, through the floodplain. Uh, so we delineate barriers to flow, such as roadways or levee, and we allow water through in kind of off-channel uh, flow paths such as that right arrow there. And the left arrow is Highway 47, kind of south of Forest Grove. So this is what model results look like. Uh, again, this is back downstream where I showed you that just a bit earlier. And you have flooding from model depth. And it looks, uh, you look at that cross section in, that I've pointed out. And it looks like it's really shallow in the center there, and it kind of looks that same way with the depth chart on the right. So we have a whole model of these results. Now, you can also do the same thing in the 2D area. In places south of Forest Grove, say like this, this is a road that goes past the wetlands that are uh, just south of Highway 47. Um, you have pointed out the road on the right, and you can see that road starting to flood in the model results there. Um, and even, this happens fairly frequently. So you can see I've taken, I have a picture of that road, and you can see there's a depth gauge on that road. And it goes up to five feet there on the right. So you can, if the water is over the road, um, emergency uh, personnel like the fire department can figure out how deep the water is on the road. And here's where something comes in. Do not ever, 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 ever drive into flooded areas. I, I know it's, okay, you guys are, you recently got your driver's license or gonna get it pretty soon uh, as, a, a hydraulic engineer, somebody who deals with floods and kind of knows what they look like and how they wreak havoc in people's lives, just don't ever drive into floodwaters. Never do it. Even if you think you know how deep it is, you don't do it. 
all of these people did not take the do not drive into floodwaters advice. They had a bad day. Um, even if you have like a big truck, that big dump truck still got stuck in floodwaters and didn't have a good day. Just don't ever do it. Just never, ever, ever do it. Yeah. You don't want to be that person uh, on the left there getting rescued by that guy. They both look like they're not having any fun. So don't just don't drive into floodwaters ever. So back now we're going to show I'm going to show you some animated results of what this looks like. Um, and I will change programs for it. So this is going to show what it looks like if the if the dam has to open its spillway all the way, like let all the water out of the lake. So you can see water comes up, goes downstream fairly quickly, but and then uh, empties out a bit more slowly than it came up. But you can see it just kind of goes through the system. Now I'm going to show you that. I'm now going to show you that same run uh, over that road that we were just talking about. It's, um, you see, comes up fairly quickly and pounds against the road right here. And finally goes over the road, goes through the wetlands, and then downstream kind of goes, fills in, bathtubs out, and eventually slowly goes back down. And we're going to stop this one. And finally, I'm going to go downstream to where we were looking at before. We have this 2D area right here. Right here, this is Tualatin, and this cross section is what I was showing you before. And we can see water is going to come down the river and actually fill in from both sides on this 2D area. Uh, so they say water always uh, flows downhill. That's not quite right. You can actually have water flowing uphill if you have a higher elevation, water surface elevation on the downstream end than the upstream end. You can kind of see this is going to start to connect and eventually get over the top of this road right here, and water is going to start flowing through this area. Um, and it's going to be like this for a long time because this. Uh, the outlet here is pretty small and there's a lot of water in this thing. So I'm just going to pause it and go back to the presentation. Okay. So you can see this is what the hydrograph, how much water there is uh, from the upstream. You can see it peaks very quickly and then comes back down. And again, this one goes up very quickly and then comes back down very much slowly. And we weren't really going to see the end of it here. So we can go back to some of the information we had at the outset where we said, okay, this is what the model looked like in the, the 100 in the, excuse me, the 1996 flood. And you can see that these two pieces right here didn't quite join in the 1996 flood. Well, that model result that I showed you just now, uh, that was a little bit more water than than was in this flood, this actual flood. It's just model tests and how we run these things. Um, so it shows pretty decent agreement because we put a little bit more water into the model and it has a little bit more flooding than showed previously. So now I'm if you have any questions, please put them into the chat or you can speak up, um, but that's all I have. And uh, I thought that was a pretty view, a nice reflection off my kayak, and uh, this was a good day. And if you want to be a civil engineer, you're going to have to go out and get your hands dirty or your kayak wet in this case and uh, see what things look like out there. So thanks for your time. I appreciate it. Yeah, I feel like that's a good advertisement for 
um, being a hydrologic engineer is sometimes it's important to go out and see the hydrology from the boat. It is. It is important. Hey, Jeff, this is CJ. Uh, how much time do you think you actually spend in the field versus at a desk? I feel like uh, a lot of people assume that engineering is all desk work. And uh, I'm, I'm glad that you've proven that to be not the case with your presentation. Um, I spend most of my time at a desk, honestly. Uh, I do work in the field occasionally, um, usually, uh, let's say, Three weeks a year total, about. So it's, uh, but it really depends on what the projects I'm working on. Uh, some some projects are more field heavy than others. So. Three weeks isn't bad. I'll take it. It's not bad. You can always wish for more, but um, I. Uh, Going outside when it's sleeting is not fun. Let's put it that way. <laughs> it's less fun. It's a different type of fun. <laughs> type two fun, I think, is the term. <laughs> uh, do you have any insight on why civil engineering specifically? Like, what what drew you to civil of all things? Sure. Um, more kind of a hands-on nature of it. Civil involves things that you can see, that you can hold, that um, not that necessarily you can manipulate because uh, it's hard to pick up a, say, a structural beam with your hands. But uh, uh, it's it involves bigger things, I guess, is kind of the uh, the answer there. It's not, I mean, I'm not going to tell you that it's uh, necessarily a, a a complicated affinity for a certain subject matter. That's, that's all it was. Well, Jeff, thank you for that presentation. Um, it is time to move over to Erica Tarbox's presentation. Um, Erica is a supervisory technical lead in our structural section, if I remember right, and, <laughs> with your title. Um, and she today is presenting um, on a topic that a lot of people recommended, um, and it is the um, the Dow's Miter Gate project. Okay. So I will uh, thank Jeff for joining us and presenting um, his RAS model. I, I actually learned quite a bit um, about the difference between 1D and 2D model, and I didn't realize that um, was the difference. So yeah, Erica, thank you for joining us. Oh, and I need to make you a co-host so that you can unmute yourself. There you awesome. go. Thanks, Michelle. Good morning, everyone. I'm really excited to be here to talk to you today about the Dalles Dam and some efforts we've been taking for repairing a crack that we found on that. But first, can I get a little bit of background? I see that we have the McKay High School engineering class. How many how many students do we have in there? Or is it? Michelle, you're We're actually on late, late start. So, um, okay. Uh, Colonel Wiley is the teacher for the McKay High School Engineering class, and he's um, coming in and joining us. Um, thankfully, we're recording this, so uh, people at their leisure will be able to see um, your presentation. Okay, well, wonderful. Um, so, I guess I would start with a little bit about myself. My name is Eric Harbox, and I am a technical lead and a team lead in the structural design section. I'll put up the slides so you have to be nice to look at. Give me a second there.
Okay, hopefully you guys are all seeing my screen there. Okay, so I have a technical lead and a team lead in the structural design section for Portland District. I have been with Portland District for six years. However, this is not where I started. I graduated from OIT in 2007, so I went to Oregon Institute of Technology in Southern Oregon. Um, I studied civil engineering and I heard earlier kind of the question, what got you into civil engineering? Honestly, I wanted a job that paid well enough so that I could go on vacation and pretend to be a marine biologist. But um, I just really was drawn to engineering because of all the different facets we get to deal with. Everything we get to be involved with and connect with from our structural side, we get to help them, we get to work with geotechnical engineers. We get to, my career has taken me to work with fish biologists, um, project managers, stakeholders. So you get a wide variety of engagement opportunities as a civil engineer. And you're kind of, um, you know, involved with a lot of different projects. So after I graduated from OIT, I went to work for the Forest Service in Southern Oregon. And my focus there was restoration type work, uh, watershed restoration, which included road removals, culvert installations, upsizing culverts. So culverts are large pipes that go under the roads to pass streams or seasonal channels. And some of the work I was dealing with was helping to pass fish and aquatic organisms through barriers such as the roadways. Um, I found that was great work, very interesting, but I wanted more of a challenge. So I went back to school, I got my master's degree, again in civil engineering, but with my focus being more on the hydrology and hydraulics aspect and um, aligning well with the work I was doing with stream restoration and aquatic organism passage. Then after, you know, kind of getting my master's and, and becoming um, well-versed in aquatic organism passage, I came to the Army Corps of Engineers, and that has been a, a great growth potential since being here. There is so much we're exposed to as engineers working for the Army Corps. We get to work on large projects with the dams and working on restoration and improvements. I, I'll talk about today the Dallas Dam and the work we're doing there, but I'm also involved with work for Folsom where we're raising the dam and we're helping with temperature control and how we regulate water temperatures downstream. Early last year, I was working on a project moving juvenile small tiny fish from um, upstream of a, of a dam to downstream and helping with that life cycle and how do we help maintain that and make it better for future generations. So at the core, I really see, and as an engineer, that's really what we're doing is we're building the future and we're helping create um, things that are going to help generations to come. So I'm going to get into the Dallas Miter Gate work. I think I only have about a half an hour for this presentation, so I am going to go quick. Okay, today I'm presenting um, just kind of a general overview of the Columbia and Snake River systems. I'll talk about the Dallas Navigation Lock and kind of lay out what we're going to see there. I'll give you a little bit of history regarding the Dallas Miter Gate itself and a little bit of an explanation of what that is. I'll talk about how we found this issue that we responded to and then our planned actions going forward. Okay. So the Dalles Dam is one of eight navigation locks or dams located on the Columbia and Snake Rivers. The Dalles Dam is um, an important point. It has hydrological features. It helps provide power um, as well as most of the dams or all of the dams on the Columbia and Snake Rivers. And I do want to note that there is approximately 600 feet of elevation difference between Portland, Oregon and Lewiston, Idaho. So we need to account for that water elevation changes. And this means that we only have 
eight lockages to go through to get us from to make up that elevation difference. So what we have is we have a boat sitting here at Portland, let's say, and we need to get it up 600 feet in elevation. And in, to do so, we have to put it into one of these navigation lock chambers. You pull it in at the lower elevation, you close all the doors on either side, and the water raises up in the navigation lock to bring it up to that new elevation. And then you open the lock on the upstream side and the boat is at that new elevation to travel. And so you can see in the first line, second line down here, Bonneville is able to lift a boat 70 feet. The Dallas is able to lift a boat 90 feet. John Day has one of the highest lifts at 113 feet. So the Dallas Dam is located on the Columbia River. It's the second in the system when you're traveling from Portland. In the center picture, you can kind of see a layout here. On the upper right-hand corner, that is Oregon. And in the lower left-hand corner, that's Washington. The navigation lock is located on the Washington border. So that's the landmass you see at the top of that photo is Washington. And to the south there, that's the Dallas Dam, the Dallas Dam proper out into the channel. And what we're going to be really focusing on is the miter gates here. Um, so this would be your north gate, and this will be your south gate, and this is the navigation lock chamber. These are the big gates that we close in order to add water or reduce water to help the boats change elevation. These are some photos of the the Dallas Miter Gate. It is comprised of two leaps. Each leap is 106 feet tall and 53 and a half feet wide. There are 35 horizontal, horizontal ribs and there are two tensionable diagonals. So you have your north gate here and your south gate here. Then you have your 35 ribs. These are all these ribs here. And then you have your two big diagonals here, but you also have another set of these diagonals here. And just like the turnbuckles on the backside of a gate, you're able to tension these diagonals to pull the gate square. Also, the gate rests against kind of like a little bit of a doorstop or a threshold. It's called a concrete sill. This concrete sill here down at the bottom, you can see it the picture here. So that's just to get you orientated with the gate and kind of the layout. This gate, the original gate was constructed in 1954. In 2010, we installed a new miter gate. In 2016, we did some tensioning and some additional work for the gate. Um, but then in 2021, we found some problems. We found some cracking, which I'll show you a little bit later in the skin plate down at the bottom of the gate. And so we had to go into an extended outage. The Columbia River is a vast system. It's a highway in itself. In itself. And there is so much commerce moving up and down the river. When we have to close the navigation lock, we, we have to shut down commerce on that river and on that highway. Can you imagine I-5 being shut down for four weeks, five weeks, the entire system? You can't go you know, down to Eugene or Salem. Um, it would cause a lot of problems. And so we really have to work closely with our stakeholders and our river users, our operating projects, and our partners, those other eight um, dams on the Columbia River, to let them know, hey, this is what we're doing. This is how long it's going to take. Close, close coordination and relationship building is very important. So we had the outage in March. Um, we had to extend it a little bit. We got that repaired. And then the engineering team look, took all that information we gathered. We did some history research, and I'll get I'll share a little bit of that with you um, regarding the gate installation from 2010 and 2016. We took all of that information and we put together a construction um, package that included specifications and construction drawings. And then we awarded that in October, and we are actively implementing that construction plan now. So that's one of the great things about being an engineer is you get to find a problem, help provide a fix and design a fix, 
And then you get to oversee the installation and the work going into that. So um, it's really you get to see the fruits of your labor and what you're doing. And so that's what we're experiencing right now. We're going through, we're in an extended outage. We're doing the repair work that we're going to talk about. So the 2010 repair work, you know, we, we went back, we looked at our notes, found that things probably weren't done. There was a little bit of adjustments having to be made. Everything has to, you know, have adjustments as you, you don't know everything, but you make the best decision you can with the information you have. And we made a couple of adjustments to the gate in 2010, 2011. So our team today took that information and incorporated that into our planned repairs for this outage. So that's from the 2010 work. Then we had our work in 2016, and this is where they came in. They tensioned down um, those cross diagonals that we were talking about. We added some material to the miter blocks. The miter blocks are in the center of the gate. Where the gates come together, that's your miter blocks. Um, there's a name for the outside of the gate, which is called the coin, and the center where the gates touch is called the miter blocks. And so you have your north and south miter blocks. So this is kind of our history and our research of what we found in 2010 from reviewing the documentation from 2010 and 2016. Then in 2021, we found that crack. And this is the crack. Um, it's fairly small. I mean, it's you know a few inches long. But during that outage, we observed the crack, we found the crack, and then we took action to get it repaired. And you can see in this photo here that we drilled out the end of the crack. And the reason for doing that is so that we could, one, kind of stop the crack from growing any further. But if the crack did grow any further, we would be able to see it. It's a good line in the sand that says, this is where the crack was. It's not growing anymore. So now I'm going to cover kind of what we did in the 2021 extended outage. So this was last year when we initially found that crack. We kind of went into a quick response because we had already shut down river traffic for, we planned to shut it down for two weeks. And now we are coming to them and saying, hey, we need to shut you down for another two weeks or another 10 days. I believe it was 10 days. And again, that's thinking about I-5. We're shutting it down for another 10 days. You're not going to be happy because you're not going to be able to make the trip to Salem. So during that extended outage, our team at the Dallas did a great job. Um, we did a lot. We did all of this work in house. We did have to have the cover plate um, fabricated off site by a local fabrication shop. But our operations team out there was able to, with working with our engineers, mill shim material to install in the miter blocks. We got the cover plate installed. So what you're seeing in this photo is the cover plate here over that crack. That is to help relieve the stress around that skin plate. So this is the face of those big 106 foot tall gates. That's one of the face here. And the crack is kind of down in, in this area here. And so we see that crack, we get it covered up with this plate so that we can help alleviate the stress. It cracked because of stress and strain inside the gate. Covered up that extra plate, adds some more material and helps spread out that load so that it's not forced right there at the crack. This hip, this photo in the middle is sh the cutting of the shim material. So I was talking about the miter where the gates come together. We had to add material here to make sure the gates came to get to improve how the gates come together. They're big, tall gates, and they bend just like you, your garden gate or um, a fence gate would bend and twist, and that's only five or six feet tall. These are 106 feet tall. So that was some of the work we did in 2021. Here's another photo um, kind of recapping why we did that work. You know, we put the cover plate in to slow down, or stop that crack from growing. We also drilled out the end. We added some shim material to... The miters, that material in there. We also added some material to the concrete sill, which that gate stop or that kind of threshold the, the gate is going to rest up against. Because of the gate 
and its position, there was a gap there, which meant water rushed through. And when you have water rushing through a small space, um, it causes vibration, it causes movement of the gate. So we wanted to close that space up and we used UHMW to do that. We brought the navigation lock back online within that 10 days that we said it would do, we would do it. Um, and then our designers went to work and started planning for the outage that's going on right now. We, but during that time frame, we not only looked at historic information, we also, with the support of our operations team, so the Dallas Dam staff, the engineers out there, the mechanics, the electricians, the folks out there, um, they helped us support with visual inspections and ROV inspections and data collection. So visual inspections, going out, looking at the gate, listening, seeing if anything has changed from the sound or visual that you can see. ROV is a remote operated vehicle, and this is a submersible submarine that we were able to send down into the navigation lock and take a look at the crack. You can't see it from the skin plate side, but on the back side, we'd able to go in through those girders and take a look at the crack and see if we monitor for any changes to the crack. And then vibration data collection. We worked with a team of specialists out of our um, one of our many design centers, and they came out and had installed accelerometers so that we could tell how much the gate was vibrating and what was going on. So we worked with them, and that data is being collected on site by operations personnel and being analyzed by our engineering staff. I must roll backwards. Okay, now we're going to start talking about our plan and scope for moving forward with the extended outage. So this is what, the, what we were doing work-wise to help improve the gate. Um, and really, we wanted to verify gate alignment, adjust the tensioning, adjust the miter blocks, and this would help reestablish the load path. We're also going to be installing a torsion box and inspection behind that cover plate and modifying the concrete sill. This is just a list of the different team members that help support us. It, you're, as an engineer, you don't do anything by yourself. You don't design in a box. You'll even learn that in engineering school. At least my experience was, you know, you had a problem or homework. You were always working as a team and, and working through things, helping each other. because You all have different views on the problem. So this is just some of the team members that helped us gather data and do design models. This image is really cool. This was taken with LIDAR and our survey team was able to go out there and take a photographic type image of the gate, but with LIDAR. And so those are all a bunch of little tiny points that make up this entire gate. The other picture here is the gudgeon and this is gudgeon allows for the gate to be adjusted in or out, move it in and out from the wall. So this is just kind of the hinge point at the top. So from those models, we were able to get a visual representation of what the gate currently looked like and what we wanted the gate to look like in the future. So the existing shape on the left, you'll see the green gate is what we, our ideal gate shape would be. The red is what we, have from survey information, believe the gate was shaped like. Keep in mind that this is exaggerated. So for reference, on our desired shape up in the right-hand corner, that's only a half an inch of difference. So on the right, in the desired shape, you can see the green is what we would ideally want the gate at. And then by adjusting those giant turnbuckles in the middle that are located at the top and the bottom down here, you can see them referenced in the drawing as well in the model, by tightening those or loosening those up, you're able to change the shape of the gate. And so we, this is our, what we're going to tell the contractor is, you need to tension this top one to eight kips. Um, and kips is a thousand pounds, or yeah, thousand pounds. So eight times a thousand. Um, and then also for the bottom one, you need to tension it to, to this set. Now keep in mind, 
as little as five kips can throw this off and, and cause problems to the gate alignment. So it, it's kind of a specialized, uh, it takes a specialized contractor to come in and perform this tension effort. In addition, we're also going to be put, placing a new seal. So here in the photo on the right is the concrete sill, S-I-L-L, -L, the concrete sill. And then you can see the gate seal, S-E-A-L, here on the gate. So this is the gate on the right and the concrete on the left. And there's a gap. Someone's able to put their thumb up there. So we want to close that gap up with some concrete sill work, which I'll talk about next, but we're also going to be replacing this seal and the miter block that we talked about earlier. That material we were able to get on short notice last year was aluminum. Aluminum and the stainless that's in here don't play well together. You have, you'll get erosion or rusting of that material. So we're taking that aluminum material out and we're putting in a plastic polymer type material, high strength. Also, we're installing a torsion box. So on the front side, we have the cover plate, which you saw, which we installed last year. We're gonna take a look, take that off. We're gonna look at the crack, and then we're gonna put the cover plate back on, but behind that, in between the girders, we're also going to be installing a steel box. This steel box would be bolted and welded together. So it's gonna be bolted to the inside of the girder, the back side of the cover plate, or the skin plate, as well as the, the girder ribs on the other side. And so, and then it's gonna be welded together. So it's a tight space, it's a hardworking environment, but this will help with the torsion that is also felt. So the cover plate covers the crack and helps spread out the stress, but then there's torsional forces because of the gate and its size, you get some twisting in there as well. And this is gonna help reduce that, carry that load from the twisting of the gate. Concrete sill, the picture earlier where you could see the gentleman putting his thumb between the gate seal and the concrete sill, we're gonna close that down. We're going to take out a chunk, it's a, what is that, 15 inch by 15 inch chunk of concrete from the existing concrete sill that I showed you in those photos earlier. We're gonna take a chunk out of there we're going to reset it. We're going to put a new sill angle. So this is going to be a steel sill angle. And we're going to close that gate up right up tight so that it's up against the new concrete sill set point and we don't have a gap there. Highlight some lessons learned, but I do want to leave some time for questions. Um, you know, as an engineer, um, it's really important communication, teamwork, you got your design, and then you have everything else that goes with it. So you get involved with a lot of different things and you learn lessons from those involvements. And we found that early and often communication is very important for us to build relationships with our regional stakeholders, with our leadership, and even with our team members. So make sure we're communicating and talking to folks. Um, with team management, documentation seemed to be very important. Documenting why we did something so that we know for future generations know when they're looking back, they can understand what they're looking at. We've, we ran into some issues here where we had to make some assumptions or try and find folks that worked on a project, you know, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, and be like, hey, why'd you make this one random decision? And if they didn't have documentation, it, it was difficult to kind of find the actual answer. Also, working with your team members out on site, you know, engineers are just one piece of that pie. You have an entire team. On this project, we worked with specialists from our design centers. We worked with regional stakeholders. We worked with operations staff. We worked with internal resources and experts. So realizing that you're just, you are a piece of a bigger team and you're all working towards a common goal and direction. Okay, 
We have about five minutes left. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. I know I went through that super fast because I wanted to be respectful of Michelle's time and the team's time. Um, but I could talk about this for a while. I guess it might be, I can also talk about um, kind of where we are right now. I, that wasn't part of this when I put it together because we have started this work and we are in the process of starting tensioning tomorrow. So I'll, I'll stop there and pause for questions. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, I didn't realize that. So that's kind of a small difference in the torsion that seems to make a huge difference in the functionality of the gate. Um, you guys, you structural engineers really work in with tighter, um, tighter bounds of acceptable limits than us dirt folks do. <laughs> Yeah, but the dirt's where it all starts. It's quite important. I think everyone, um, so as like a, a geotechnical or, or dam safety, whatever, the, or, or geology, um, it's important to have a good foundation because if that concrete or if the navigation lock walls weren't in bedrock or there was a problem with the bedrock, we, we wouldn't be able to have this type of gate. Okay. And I appreciate you going over the different um, or the interaction between the people who are staying at their desks in Portland or whatever suburb they're in and the people on the project because the uh, we do very good design work but if it weren't for the folks that are involved on our projects we would have no idea when things go wrong until we're out there our once a year once every five years to inspect Correct. Yeah, we're out there to inspect, but even during this outage, we were out there. We were side by side. So during the our our kind of initial response back last year, we sent engineers out. They were on site working side by side with our operations staff to address problems and troubleshoot. So it was a high energy type of environment where you were troubleshooting problems and coming up with solutions and working together and then communicating that up to someone like me who then starts working with our leadership here at Portland District to coordinate you know, schedules and funding. You gotta pay for all this. Uh, make sure everyone's in agreement because it's not just, you don't make decisions in a vacuum. And so you make your decision and communicate it up and discuss it and make sure that all parties kind of agree that like, yeah, that's the best way to go. And then now we're in the outage. So we've closed down river traffic, I-5 is shut and it'll be shut through March 19th. Um, and we're working hard to implement all those designs we've pulled together for the last eight, nine months and all that information. So we have we had engineers out on site over the weekend that were working with the surveyors that were looking at how plumb the gates are, how straight the gates are. We have surveyors out there Yesterday, analyzing the information, we're talking about it. So we're out there in the field working side by side with the construction contractor. And we're back here at the office trying to make sure that everything's working and we're getting the desired results from our plan. So it's not just, um, you know, design something from your desk and hand it off to someone else. It is an active, engaged kind of dynamic environment sometimes. And sometimes, you know, you do, you do, there are, there's ebbs and flows where you are sitting at your desk and designing, and then you're out in the field and, uh, yeah. And that's just a small piece of what we do because we have, I can start talking about the bridge program. I could start talking about the other inspections we do outside of this. There's a lot of interesting stuff our engineers are involved with. Well, thank you. Uh, I appreciated you joining in this anyway, but knowing that there's a lock, lock shut down right now, and you're probably super busy, I extra appreciate you coming and joining us. Yeah, yeah, no worries. I, I love this, and I appreciate the opportunity. Excellent. Uh, so, I, um, Colonel Wiley, um, do you have students uh, in your class now? Is it a good time to move on to the, the next uh, program? Oh, 
either way, we're recording it, so people are going to enjoy it. Well, thank you, Erica, for joining us today. Yeah, you're welcome, Michelle. I'm going to go ahead and sign off. Okay, cool. Have a good day. Thanks. Bye. Okay, uh, CJ, can I have you introduce Emmett? I think he's up next. Yeah, so we've got Emmett coming on. He uh, was able to put together a presentation for us at uh, figuratively the last minute. It wasn't certainly mm -hmm. wasn't the last minute, but we were asking around to fill a spot, and uh, it seemed like Emmett was willing and able, and so we appreciate him coming down and. Uh, if you give a little bit of background about yourself and then get her started, that'd be great. Sounds good. I'm just going to share my screen real quick. Um, let's see. Can you guys see my screen or do I need to change oh, yeah. the, the screen that I'm sharing? I you might want to change the other screen. This is okay. uh, your screen, the one with the notes on it. Gotcha. Okay, that looks beautiful. That's better. Okay, great. So, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Emmett Karn, and I am a mechanical engineer. I work with the Hydroelectric Design Center for Portland District Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, specifically, I work in what's called the tur turbine section or the turbo machinery section. Um, so we get to work on the actual rotating uh, components that um, harness electricity in, in hydropower plants across the country. Uh, so I'm going to talk a bit about that today. But first, I'm just going to go over my, my biography, uh, a little bit of my background, how I got into engineering. Um, I went to school at UC Santa Barbara in California, and I got my degree in mechanical engineering. Um, I, I, when I was in high school, I really didn't know what type of engineering I wanted to get into, and uh, I was interested in all kinds of things. I was interested in math. I knew I, I loved to learn about physics, chemistry. I had a really wide variety of interests, and I got into mechanical engineering specifically because I think it provided me with the ability to um, get into a lot of like a, a lot of broad uh, engineering concepts. Mechanical engineering is very broad. There's a lot of different uh, lanes that you can go down in the field of mechanical engineering. So I kind of wanted to keep my my options open um, and see kind of what interests I would have. And just going to school and learning all the different. Um, disciplines of mechanical engineering, it helped me understand where I wanted to go. Uh, and so I did some academic research during my undergrad. I would definitely recommend uh, for those that have the ability to work in a research group um, while you're getting your undergrad. That's a really cool opportunity. It really solidified for me uh, my interest in doing real kind of analytical type of mechanical engineering. Um, and then once I graduated, I, I didn't really know, I still didn't really know exactly what I wanted to do with my engineering degree. Um, but I knew I had this interest in, in learning about clean energy and renewable energy. And I wanted to kind of somehow figure out how I could uh, work in the energy industry. And so that's kind of why I was interested in working for the Hydroelectric Design Center. Um, I got hired out of college. I um, in 2018, I moved to Portland for the job, and I started out in the engineering training program. Uh, that was my first two years with the Corps, and I think some other speakers might have talked about it already, but I just, it, it was a great experience for me. Um, I got to travel all around the country. Um, I went to places like South Dakota. I went to places like Nashville. Um, and you get to actually learn on site with the people that are working on the equipment every day. Um, so they'll, you know, I was actually working at hydropower plants, talking with the mechanics, um, talking with the engineers that are on site and learning about what they do uh, and, and, and learning about the actual machinery, because a lot of what we do is just um, we do out of the office. So. We look at drawings and um, we look at photos, but to really be in person 
at a site and, and learn and see things firsthand is really uh, the best way to learn. So that's what I uh, was able to do through the EIT program. Uh, and it was just a really great way uh, to learn about hydropower. Um, so I work specifically in the turbine section, which I'll talk about. Um, but I just wanted to talk just broadly about why I really enjoy working for the core. Um, that working for the core has a lot of benefits. Um, they really go out of their way to uh, make to facilitate your learning experience, like I said, with the EIT program, um, but they also offer a lot of training opportunities. Uh, whatever you're interested in, um, they will be able to uh, help guide you and, and, and seek out those interests. Um, but what I specifically like about working with HDC is that I just get to do a lot of really cool engineering work. Um, and I'm going to be able to talk about that today, um, but we, we really get to work on um, the stuff that's, that I think is really interesting, which is the things that actually create electricity at our dams. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that today, uh, but first just wanted to just kind of provide a background on, on what is hydropower. Um, this diagram is kind of just a cross-sectional image of a dam. And so the way I think about dams is kind of just a, you can kind of think about it as a giant battery. And all a, all a dam does is it, it, it stores uh, the potential energy of water at a higher elevation at, uh, than the lower elevation at, at, at the other, at the tailwater of the dam. And so what we seek to do is to turn that potential energy of the water into electrical energy. And so the way that that's done is first uh, converting that potential energy into kinetic energy, which is uh, spinning the actual turbine. And so you can see the turbine labeled one, it's a little small, uh, but that is just a huge steel um, structure and it's, it's really heavy and it, and it's, it's crazy how much <laughs> how the water is able to just spin this giant uh, steel turbine. And so connected to that turbine is uh, a generator that's labeled uh, number two. And so as that turbine spins, uh, the generator is also spinning or, or what's called the rotor. And the rotor, um, if you've learned about electromagnetism in school or, or physics class, um, it induces uh, a voltage that creates electricity. So if you spin uh, magnets around uh, coils that have, uh, that have current in them, um, there's a physical phenomena that you're able to um, induce a voltage and uh, get, get energy. And so that energy is taken off of the generator uh, and then routed to the switch yard, and then it's transmitted out into and it's used for uh, the electricity that we use here. Um, and so how much electricity can you really get from hydropower? Uh, well, it, it amounts to about two and a half percent of the total US energy production, which might not sound like a lot, but if you think about the grand total of all of US energy production, that's, that's very substantial. Um, but specifically, it's really concentrated in the Pacific Northwest. So uh, I was interested that 37% of Oregon's total uh, energy source actually comes from hydropower. And it's the reason why uh, power is, is relatively inexpensive in Oregon uh, is directly related to how much hydropower uh, we have on the grid. Um, so it's just a great resource for us in the Pacific Northwest. Um, but specifically, the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, a ton of those um, of that hydropower capacity. So uh, out of all of the total US hydropower in the country, um, the Army Corps of Engineers owns around 25% of that capacity. And so the Army Corps has 75 um, power producing dams and they're spread all over the country. So you can see this diagram of where where the dams are. You can see this kind of um, build up around uh, where we are in the Pacific Northwest, but then you can see that it's also spread out to different regions of the country as well. Um, and so there are 75 power producing dams, but there are 356 total generating units. So 
a generating unit is a turbine connected to a generator. So uh, at pretty much all of the dams, there's more than one uh, generating unit per dam, and uh, the amount of generating units per dam varies based off of how big the dam is and uh, what kind of flows you're able to get. So lastly, I just wanted to talk about hydropower is, is a great resource because it uh, doesn't burn any fuel. Um, you're not uh, releasing carbon dioxide um, through the process. And also um, as a benefit, unlike wind and solar that can be kind of variable energy sources, hydropower has the benefit of being able to be turned off and on with as demand requires. So um, you can think of, I mean, the, the energy is stored behind a dam. And so uh, maybe uh, at night when, when solar is not able to be on the grid or maybe when it's not very windy uh, and, and there's not uh, the ability to harness a lot of wind energy, uh, that's where hydropower can come in and uh, fill that demand uh, at a moment's notice. So uh, that's kind of why I think hydropower is just a really uh, great resource for us. Uh, so specifically, I'm kind of zooming out and zooming in on what 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 I do. Uh, so what do we do at the Hydroelectric Design Center? Well, we do engineering uh, uh, engineering work for those 75 core owned hydroelectric power plants. So we actually work uh, not just in the Pacific Northwest, but uh, all around the country for all of the uh, power plants that are owned by the core. And what we do is involves planning. Um, for different projects, we do the actual engineering and design, uh, and then we also uh, manage the construction of a lot of the, the major hydropower projects. And what I like is we get to work on a multidisciplinary teams. So there's all different types of engineers that work at the Hydroelectric Design Center. Obviously, there's a lot of mechanical engineers like me, um, but there's also electrical engineers that work with our generators and power transmission. Uh, there's structural engineers that uh, work with, you know, the structural integrity of components. Uh, we have computer scientists. Uh, we even have economists and mathematicians uh, that help determine if uh, hydropower projects are profitable and which ones we should uh, allocate our funding to. So uh, you get to work with a lot of different um, types of, of engineers, which, which I enjoy as well. So what do we do in the actual turbo machinery section? That's the specific section that I work at at the Hydroelectric Design Center. Uh, what I like is we get to work on all stages of major hydropower projects. So what we're doing is we are doing, uh, we're essentially replacing all of, you can think of it as uh, <laughs> a lot of these dams were built in like the 50s, 60s, 70s, and they were built with, um, old equipment that's that's aged over time. And so we are in the process of evaluating uh, and planning to determine which of those uh, hydropower units that we should um, rehabilitate or uh, replace the components of with new modern equipment. Uh, so we're involved in the planning of which of those uh, projects we, sh we should do. And then we're also involved in the design. So we will uh, do plans and specifications to determine uh, which components need to be replaced and how they should be replaced. Um, we create drawings and plan out the entire project. Um, and then once that uh, those drawings are, are complete and the design is complete, we then uh, lump that into a contract that gets awarded to a contractor who will actually install the equipment and, and do the construction of the, of the project. And so we're also involved in the engineering during that phase, we're actually on site a lot of the time, um, monitoring construction and making sure that that everything is is going as planned. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the planning stages. That's a lot of what I've been able to work on um, at, in the turbine section. Um, so what they are is we're trying to determine if uh, replacing a hydropower unit with new modern equipment um, is is worth it or if, if it's economically beneficial to the government. And so why do the study? Like I said, um, we have aging turbines that over time, um, with time turbines will degrade in what we call efficiency 
which is uh, the amount of power that you can get out of a unit uh, for the same amount of flow. So over time, uh, parts will corrode and, and things won't really flow as, as they did when they were first installed. And so um, just replacing a unit with uh, new modern equipment can uh, increase the power output of, of our units, um, which is really important to us. Um, also, some of our dams, when they were first installed, the turbines were built for hydraulic conditions that might have changed over time. So maybe there's more flow at, that a dam sees uh, now than it used to see in the 70s. Um, so we look at flows through, through the dam and try to understand um, what kind of capacity the units have. And, and maybe we can uprate the units and get more power out of them if there's that availability of flow. Um, and that, that kind of translates to changes in operation over time. Um, you can see this diagram uh, it was a was a dam that I was studying. Um, and you can see the, the, we call a heat map. You can see the, uh, so on the X axis is head, which is the elevation of the dam or the head is the elevation difference at either side of the dam. And then on the Y axis is uh, flow through the unit. And so we can kind of, um, pinpoint uh, a type of operation that the unit experiences. And with those different types of operation or, or amounts of flow or different um, elevations, we can pinpoint what efficiency the unit is operating at. And so uh, specific units are designed to be most efficient at a certain flow and a certain head range. And uh, a lot of times those those efficiency points change over time, and uh, and we're no longer operating at the efficient the efficient zone of a unit. So that might be a reason why we might want to uh, pursue uh, replacement of the turbine. There's also technological advancements uh, that have been made over time that increase the efficiency of of hydropower units, um, and then there's also things other concerns that we're looking at. Uh, for example, a lot of our dams in, in the Pacific Northwest especially are, we're looking at uh, creating more fish-friendly turbines. So um, you can see this diagram is uh, what we call a computational fluid dynamic simulation. And we're simula simulating flow through the entire hydropower unit. And we're trying to optimize the design so that uh, fish traveling through the unit um, will be able to survive uh, going through the dam. And so that's a big concern uh, with some of our, our dams on the Columbia, especially because there's um, salmon populations um, that rely on, on, on these waters to, um, to travel to the ocean. So that's, that's also uh, some re a lot of the research we do is, is looking into uh, fish friendly designs. Um, and so what do we study with these planning stages of sizing studies? Uh, well, first we do a performance test. So we actually go out on site, install sensors on units and determine how efficient the unit is operating now. Um, and once we kind of have that baseline of how a unit is operating, uh, we can develop potential alternatives. And so uh, we can say uh, one alternative might be to let the unit uh, run with its current uh, and do nothing and, and keep the, the current turbine in place. Uh, other alternatives might be to replace the turbine, but keep it the same size. And then maybe another alternative would be to uh, uprate the unit and create a bigger turbine that can produce more power uh, with more flow. And so we kind of weigh these different alternatives and we actually run um, computer models, that's where the economists come in, and we simulate running these alternatives uh, for years into the future, and we simulate uh, hydrology data which flows through the dam, uh, we forecast energy prices for years into the future, um, and we look at uh, reliability. So um, replacing a unit with new equipment means that there will be less unit outages because uh, components are new and they won't um, 
need to be replaced as much as 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 they are currently. So we we take all these factors, uh, we run these computer models, and at the end we determine which alternative is the most beneficial to the government. And uh, and so that's that's a lot of what we work on. Um, and it's it's pretty interesting because you get to be involved in uh, the planning stages for really big uh, hydropower projects. Uh, and then so once we determine that we do want to uh, replace a hydropower unit with new modern equipment, uh, that's when we start the design process. So we're looking at the original drawings of the unit. Um, you can see this drawing here is an original drawing. Um, it was probably uh, drawn in the 60s or 70s. Uh, a lot of them are hand drawn, uh, pen and paper. We don't do that anymore. A lot of <laughs> our our drawings are are now obviously on on computer software, and uh, we're able to do it on the computer a lot quicker uh, than actually hand drawing uh, all the components. But uh, we we look through all of the drawings. We figure out what needs to be replaced. Uh, we make drawings of our own. Uh, to, to kind of plan out the project and determine uh, what needs to be done. Uh, we also draft specifications. We determine what materials we'll need. Um, we uh, specify what kind of inspections we'll need to do uh, once these components are manufactured. Um, we look at um, the schedule. We want to know how long the project should take. And then at the end of the day, we're, we're also just uh, looking at performance and, and we're trying to provide specifications that can, um, that can guarantee that we'll, we'll have a really good uh, turbine that can produce uh, more power. <laughs> and so once, once uh, these designs are complete, we lump all of these um, drawings and specifications into a contract. Uh, like I said, gets awarded to uh, a contractor who will actually do all of the construction and and uh, disassemble, reassemble the unit. Uh, but first, uh, we do a model test. And so when we're doing a new um, a turbine, we first build a scaled down model. And what we can do is we can understand what kind of performance uh, the full scale will have uh, before we manufacture this giant component. So you can see in this, I guess there's not really much scale in this photo, um, but these things are really small. Like they're probably, uh, the model is probably around a foot in diameter and you can actually see the turbine blades in there. And uh, we look at the flows. You can look through this plexiglass uh, viewing window um, to see if there's um, cavitation or bubbles forming, and we can um, also run tests to determine which efficiency uh, we will likely see when, um, when we build this thing in full scale. So the model testing stages will take, uh, can, can take about a year. They have to build this, this small scale model, and then we just run all these different tests on, on the model. Um, but if everything looks good, and we determine that that uh, that design will work. That's when we start building the full scale uh, turbine. And so, here are some some pictures of uh, fabrication of a turbine runner. Um, a runner is just a word for um, what you think of when you think of a turbine. It's the it's the blades that that uh, cause the un cause the uh, rotation. And so, um, we actually get to tra travel to the foundries to witness um, these runners being manufactured. Uh, we do a lot of material testing on the steel that's used. Um, so we'll actually cut off uh, uh, parts of the steel that was cast and we'll actually do testing to make sure that those material properties are uh, what we want and what we require. Um, and then once the runners are, are actually made, um, we'll, we'll, we'll disassemble the unit. So we have these giant cranes that will uh, take off the generator and then slowly just take off components of the, of the unit. Um, and uh, that, that can take a long time. Disassembly is a, a long process. Um, and then once those components are, are taken out, um, we'll either replace them or refurbish. So uh, 
uh, you can see, you know, these are original components that have been sitting in, in water for a long time. So they can corrode, uh, their surfaces can be damaged. Um, so we'll decide if we wanna clean those up or if we want to just replace them entirely. Uh, so we'll do a lot of inspections and, um, and cleaning of those components. Uh, we'll also do uh, what's called a rewind of the generator. Uh, I don't really work on this too much because I'm a mechanical engineer, um, but this this is uh, uh, essentially a refurbishment of of the generator, and that can take about half a year, and that's done in parallel with all of the turbo machinery work that we do. Uh, and then once everything is refurbished or replaced and uh, ready to go, that's when we uh, reassemble the unit back to where it was. Um, and that's done in the reverse order uh, that we do the disassembly. And so that can also, that can be about a quarter of a year as well. And then once the unit is back in place, that's when we do uh, alignment. And so you can think of these hydropower units, they're, they're really, um, they're really long. Uh, there's a uh, turbine at the bottom and then there's a long shaft and then there's a generator at the top. And so we wanna make sure that the entire unit is center in, uh, in the hole and that there's no um, misalignment because once you start the unit and, it can, and it's misaligned, you can have a lot of issues uh, with vibrations or um, uh, just just problems in general. <laughs> so we do a lot of alignment checks to make sure that everything is ready. And then we do commissioning, which is where we actually turn on the, the new unit for the first time. Um, and we're, we're, we're there on site and we're making sure that everything is running smoothly. Uh, a lot of what we look at are the temperatures of the bearings. So the, the bearings are what keeps the, the shaft in place. And, um, and if those are getting really hot, then we know that there's a lot of vibrations in the unit and there's something going on that we need to shut down the unit. So we're, when we do commissioning, we're looking really closely at the temperatures of the bearings uh, to make sure that those stabilize over time and don't overheat because that can tell us that we have issues with the way we've reassembled the unit. And then lastly, if that all goes well, that's when we'll do our final performance test. So we'll go back, we'll install those sensors on the unit, uh, and then we'll get uh, an understanding of how much this helped, um, how much uh, efficiency we've gained by replacing the turbine uh, with, with newer modern equipment. Um, and a lot of times we can get uh, really high uh, efficiency gains by doing this. So on the order of uh, sometimes uh, five to 7%, I'd say, um, which is huge when it, when it comes to power generation on this scale. Uh, if you can make things more efficient by just 5%, that can be a lot of more power and, and a lot of money um, to, for the government. So that's a really important step. And that's pretty much it. That's kind of taking you through the whole process of hydropower uh, rehabilitations and turbine replacements. So um, does anybody have any questions? Um, so I know that right now it's uh, the end of the session with Pat McKay. Uh, were there any questions from the audience? Emmett, I was wondering, it seemed like you, uh... It seemed like you had engineering as kind of your your goal when you were going to college. Uh, do you have any advice for anyone who's still on the fence about whether they're interested in engineering or not? Someone who's less less sold on it at this point in their their high school life. Yeah, I mean, I also yeah, I I, I might have sounded like I was for sure knew I wanted to go into engineering, but I, I probably wasn't at that stage of my life in high school. I didn't really know what kind of, I knew I liked math and science, uh, but I didn't know what exactly I wanted to pursue. So I think I would recommend if, if you do enjoy math and science and you want to use that passion or that, that skill that you have to solve real world problems, I think engineering 
would be a great field to go into um, because uh, you know a lot of science in, in separate from engineering can be really analytical uh, and you don't necessarily get to see uh, your uh, work being put into action whereas with the work that I do as a mechanical engineer, uh, all of my hard work is actually, I can see it at the final uh, stages. I can see the, the turbine being you know, put into a unit and I can see it being turned on. And it's, it's kind of a, a, a cool experience to actually solve real world problems with uh, math and science. So if that's what you're into, that's, that's I would recommend engineering. Well, I should probably get to our next presentation. And it, first of all, thank you for coming in at the last minute and facing us. And also thank you for doing a great presentation. Thank you. It was fun. Thank you. Okay. Uh, CJ, can I have you introduce uh, Teresa and Cole? Yeah. So moving on to uh, not quite the last of the day. It just looks like the, the second last. Uh, we're going to have a. Looks like Cole, uh, Cole co presentation uh, with Teresa Casper and uh, Cole. I'm going to butcher it. I'm sorry. Pobans, Pobans. Got him. Second try. And uh, take it away. All right, can everyone see PowerPoint? Yep, we're good. All right, hi everyone. Um, as CJ mentioned, I'm Teresa Casper and I'm presenting with my coworker, Cole. Uh, we're gonna be talking more about the electrical side of hydro and a little bit about how we got into it and focus a lot on some of the cool hydroelectric equipment that we deal with as electricals. So you may have heard a little bit of an overview of HDC and USACE in previous presentations, but we're gonna go over that a little. And then, as I mentioned, focus on some hydroelectric equipment and also some HDC projects that Cole and I have worked on that have been particularly interesting. So a little bit of my background, I was born and raised in Portland. I have a really large extended family here, as you can see in the picture. Um, after high school, I started at University of Portland um, as an electrical engineering major. And then before my senior year of college, I actually started at the Hydroelectric Design Center as a student intern. And after graduating, I went into our engineering and training program and now have been with HTC for about six years. Hey everyone, uh, as CJ introduced me, my name is Cole and I've had a very similar background to Teresa actually. I grew up in Bremerton, Washington, which is not too far from Seattle, but Bremerton doesn't have any pretty pictures. So I put a picture of Seattle up there too make it nice and pretty for the presentation. I also went to University of Portland for college and after graduating in 2021, I joined Hydroelectric Design Center. So I've been with them for about eight months now. And I now live in Hillsboro with my girlfriend, Jess, and we have a little cat. So the Army Corps of Engineers, a lot of people, when they hear it, they mostly think, okay, work on military construction, like on military bases. And we do a lot of that work, but where Cole and I work specifically, we work on hydro and Army Corps does work on a lot of other civil work. So these are some of the civil works that hydro, that uh, the Army Corps of Engineer works on. Um, at HTC, we deal pretty much exclusively with hydro and also some uh, pumping facilities, but mostly Cole and I are working on the big equipment on hydroelectric dams. So what's cool about hydro in general is it plays a big role in our grid. Hydro is considered the largest renewable energy producer in the U.S. and 
the Army Corps is actually the fifth largest electric, electric supplier in the U.S. So power from hydro works, you know, pretty much like any other power plant. Our electricity is generated at the hydroelectric dam, and then it is transformed in a transformer. The power is carried over transmission lines, where it's eventually set down for use on, you know, your residential houses, commercial buildings. And what's cool about hydro, as opposed to some other renewable energy sources, is we can adjust the power that we're generating based on demand. So at HCC specifically, we work on planning and engineering design for hydropower facilities. A lot of the work that Cole and I do has to do with rehabbing existing equipment. You know, a lot of these dams are built in the 40s and we have original equipment that we're either replacing or updating in some way to make more efficient or easier to troubleshoot. This is a breakdown of HCC's organizational structure. Um, as you can see, we have a mechanical branch, a cybersecurity branch, our electrical branch. And so one thing to like keep in mind going into the engineering field is for in a lot of cases, I believe you're gonna end up working with, you know, many different um, types of engineers, which is what I think makes it so interesting and fun, especially at HPC, is we work on these teams with multiple different disciplines. This is a map showing all of our Army Corps-owned dams. So we have 75 dams across the nation. Um, me, myself, I've worked at HEC for six years, and I've been to 35 dams so far, which is kind of fun. I'm hoping to get a couple more in there. Um, but that's kind of what's fun working at HEC is we are able to go and visit these different dams. So this is just a video that's kind of going to walk through how a hydroelectric project works. Maybe. It's not coming up for me. Let's see if. It just through. Okay, well, I guess the video is not working. I, I apologize. I don't know what's happening. No problem. Well, I think Emmett may have gone over a little bit about how it works. Um, you know, we have our water flowing through the penstock, which then goes to our turbine. And as the turbine spins, it'll move the generator with it. And that's how we produce electricity. So let's jump into the previous topic that Emmett went over, the turbines. Oh, Cole, it's not in presentation mode. No? Oh, it's not. You are completely right. Thank you. <laughs> Go ahead. All right, let's jump into the turbines. So this turbine, we have main, two main types of turbines in the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. This one is called a Kaplan, and they're usually with three to four blades, and they can actually change the blade angle to go faster or slower, depending on what the system needs. Uh, the picture on the left is showing a pretty old Kaplan unit, because again, most of these dams were built in the 40s, 50s, 60s. Um, so most of these blades are being welded in place due to excessive maintenance issues like oil leakage. So they actually lose the functionality to change the blade angle, but the newer ones still have it. This is called a Francis turbine, and they have the exact same function. They are spinning the shaft and turning the um, generator so we can produce electricity. The main difference here is, as you can see, you probably can't change the blade angle. You can't at all because the blades are essentially welded between two discs. Um, but a cool feature with the Francis turbines is that they have little holes at the bottom of the turbine that allow dissolved oxygen to bubble into the water for the fish downstream. So you have excellent dissolved oxygen output of this turbine. Now let's move a little bit to a higher elevation for the generator. These are the star of the show. These giant these are the giant machines that produce power, and they have two main components, the rotor and the stator. 
Now, this rotor, here's a picture of the one at Bonneville Dam, which is pretty close to Portland, about 40 miles west, east of here. Um, the rotor is the part of the generator that spins with the turbine and the turbine shaft. These are almost always over about 500,000 pounds and over 30 feet in diameter. This one from Bonneville is 825,000 pounds and 37 feet in diameter. So those cranes that are lifting up the rotor and moving it to different places, yeah, they are very powerful. And the second part of the rotor are the poles. And the field poles are made up of two parts, the insulating body, which you can see on the bottom right, and the coils, which is wrapped around the insulating body, as you can see on the top right. And on the left is a picture of them just being installed into the rotor, into those little slots. Now, when the generator is spinning, the exciter, which we'll go, we'll go over later, sends them DC current, thus the rotor poles are energized and turn into magnets. Um, when brought near other metal and enter the stator and its coils. And here's a picture of the stator when the rotor is removed. And pop quiz, if anyone wants to put in the chat, um, can anyone tell me the average air gap distance between the rotor and the stator? They're not touching, there's a, there's a little gap in there. So if you wanna ask your teacher to put in the chat how far you think it is away, I'll give you the answer a little bit later. Uh, the stator core is made up from thousands of laminated metal sheets. You can see in the picture on the right, they got burned a little bit on these little corners right here. Um, this is really bad, and that means they need to be replaced, which involves restacking that entire section of tiny little metal sheets. You have to wear special gloves so you don't get cut because they're super thin. Um, it's lots of work and very, very expensive. And here's a picture of the slots that the stator core, that the stator coils will go into. And the next picture will kind of give you a better idea of what that looks like. Slot, these slots and some of some wedges um, you can see, see in the chat. Can't see it. Anyway, um, these coils are rammed into these slots along with some little wedges you can see in the picture on the left to keep them in place while the rotor is spinning and the magnetic force is kind of trying to pull them out. Uh, so what happens when one of the energized stator coils touches ground? Obviously, you can see that this is pretty catastrophic and not a good thing. So what we do when we repair a coil is we may have to take out what there's physically next to the coil because it may have exploded because of high energy running in, in through that coil. And we might also have to take out some electrically next to it too. Uh, so for example, we had to replace, I think 12 coils in this job that one of my coworkers is doing. Now here you can see when we replace a cable, we are not really, I mean, I mean when we replace a coil, we're not really replacing the coil. Um, we're actually just gonna bypass it and jump rope. So you can see in the middle of the picture on the left, you can see this is somewhere where the coil failed. I, we don't have a picture of exactly where it failed. Um, but on the bottom of the picture and about the middle, you can see where we took that um, coil connector. This is, this is just a bar of metal cable um, is going to jumper over that coil and essentially take it out of the system. So the generator is just going to operate with one less coil. And the picture on the right is a picture of the, um, the failed coils uh, connection. So another piece of equipment that um, us electricals at HDC work on are our generator step up transformers. So you guys have probably seen the small transformers like outside on our electrical pole 
that lower the voltage to be able to bring to your houses. The generator step of transformers on a power plant work the same way, except they're doing the opposite. They're increasing the voltage and they are very, very large pieces of equipment. Next slide. Uh, so this is kind of showing the internals of your transformer. Um, these are windings. And in that middle picture, you can kind of see the concentric circles that a winding is wound in. Um, and what's really interesting about transformers is almost like 90% of what they put inside this large piece of equipment is done by hand. So someone by hand wraps those Windings, which are basically just like copper bars that are wrapped in paper. Um, so part of what we do at HEC is like observe them doing this work at a factory, which is really cool. Another really interesting and kind of scary part of working with our large GSU transformers is moving them. So whenever we have to replace a transformer, install a new one, the transformer has to be shipped from the factory to our power plant. And so we have, you know, like the Bonneville transformers weigh 565,000 pounds. So moving them can require a lot of work. Um, so in this left picture, it's actually a smaller transformer that we were able to lift with a crane. And you can kind of see a person standing there for the scale of how big this transformer is. Um, on the right side is one of our larger transformers that is too big to be moved with a crane. And so we use what we call a jack and skid method where those rails are put down and the transformer is very carefully moved onto the rails and skid into place. And sometimes it can take hours depending on how big a transformer is. So moving on to one of the different systems in a hydroelectric plant is the governor. And the governor are, is the device that controls the wicket gates and valves to control water flow. So this is the piece that kind of lets water in you know, near the turbine and makes it spin. Um, and when we have Kaplan units, it also controls the blade angle. And what you see here is a very old governor from, or a diagram of a governor from 40s or 50s. So originally we had mechanical governors controlled by mechanical operations such as valves and pistons. Now those are decent devices, but they're difficult to attain very, very high levels of precision. So we upgraded. Now most of our projects have digital governors that take up much less area and are easier to troubleshoot. Um, you can see in the pictures, the one on the left is the mechanical governor. You can see the many valves and pistons that are used to operate and measure pressure, water flow, all sorts of things in this cabinet. Right is the upgraded version, the digital governor that's ran almost entirely on PLCs. And you can see the immense amount of floor space that is saved just by upgrading from mechanical to digital. Uh, this is a pretty typical interface we get to see. Uh, this tells you pretty much everything you need to know about the generator that's operating um, and about the wicket gates and the blade angle. This is really what our operators get to work with every day to make sure that the machine is running at maximum efficiency and uh, best of power. So kind of similar to how the governor controls the speed that our generator is spinning, what our exciter does is it controls the generator's terminal voltage. And kind of the theme here, similar for governors, what the work involves with exciters now is going from our old rotating exciters, which is the picture shown on the left, to newer digital exciters, which is the picture shown on the right. Um, you know, the rotating exciters, I think they're like a lot cooler in terms of how they look and how they operate the theory behind it. But, you know, going to digital exciters is a lot better for our plants because they're a lot easier to troubleshoot. Um, they have less points of failure. Um, so that's part of work that Cole and I would do is working on putting a package together for replacing these old 
exciters. Um, however, it is, you know, worth noting that the equipment, like the rotating exciters and analog digital analog governors, mechanical governors, they've been working for, you know, very since originally installed. Um, it's just a matter of going to something that's easier for the plant to maintain. So one of the other really interesting aspects of hydropower plants is protected relaying. And it's exactly what it sounds like. <laughs> protected relaying protects not only the equipment, but the staff by detecting deviations from the desired operating range. We can monitor then alert for one or more of current voltage frequency and rate of change of any of the devices that we've already went over. Protective relays are like the step before the breaker. So the, bre the protective relays will tell the breaker when to open if the system is overloaded or if a fault has occurred anywhere in the system. And the nice thing about digital relay replacements um, is that we originally had these um, electromechanical relays, which are a lot bigger and a little bit more clunky. They worked, but again, we've talked about optimizing and getting modern and getting sleeker and easier for the plant to maintain. Digital relays take up about half the space, and you can see that in this giant yellow, wonderfully colored cabinet here. Um, the electromechanical relays take up the entire thing and tons of um, weight and floor space, but here on the right, you can see that we've gotten rid of half the cabinet. This is all empty space here on the little left. And um, on the right of the left-hand picture, it's just full of digital relays that take up a lot smaller amount of space. Now, this is a generic terminal block, as you can see on the left, and it actually has those digital relays in it. We use these every day We even, when we even just Think about a digital relay. Um, so we use these very, very often at HTC. Now, the picture on the right is also an example of some resistance calculations. So to answer maybe some of you skeptics out there, um, do your homework and practice those math skills because we do use them every day. But don't worry, we both still think that being an engineer is the most fun job in the world. That's what it is. Um, this is a pretty average drawing that you may produce, honestly, if um, you ever join HDC in the later years. Um, the top is what's being removed, probably some of those electromechanical relays um, that are big and take up three, four, five, almost full cabinets. And down here is the digital relays that we are going into in red, and it only takes up three cabinets plus some switches here and there. So, our flash and protective relays kind of go hand in hand. Oh, I can't see the presentation anymore. Cool. Oh, there. It's back. Um, so, an arc flash is basically an electrical arc that can result in, like, a really big explosion, as you see in that picture. So, it's a very serious um, area of study that HTC does because it has to do with personal safety. So, basically, some, an engineer at HTC will analyze um, how, how much energy can be produced if there were to be a fault. Um, and based on that, they give recommendations on what personal protective equipment they have to wear. Um, so you can see that hooded um, picture in the top left. That's an example of a suit that an electrician would have to wear if they're working on equipment that's live. In some cases, the risk may be so high that you know, um, the recommendation will be you can't even work on this equipment unless it's completely isolated. And an engineer will also work with the protective relay settings engineer to figure out, okay, how soon do we need to say this breaker needs to be tripped to make sure that, you know, they have to balance, okay, being able to keep the facility running versus how much energy can, produce, can be produced to make sure it's safe for everyone. Um, this is a video of a controlled setting of an arc flash.
So it's a really, really loud explosion. Um, there are a lot of videos out there actually of arc flashes happening at power plants. I didn't want to show them here today. If you guys want to see, you can look them up. But yeah, it's, it's pretty serious. So we have a lot of expertise at HDC that deals with figuring out arc flash. So this is an example of those circuit breakers I were talking about where we'll trip a breaker to isolate a system. Um, they are big pieces of equipment, but they work pretty much similarly to the way your circuit breakers at home would work. You know, when a circuit is overlaid, overloaded, it'll trip and, you know, de-energize a system. Um, that bottom picture is one of our switch yards, and this is kind of the mark where the work from HDC, Army Corps ends, and it goes on to utility. You guys may have heard of Bonneville Power Administration. So they would work on things from here onward. Um, a lot of the times, the HDC engineers, especially the protective relay engineers, work with um, people from BPA or from a utility in order to figure out the right settings. Um, but in terms of who owns the equipment, this is kind of where it ends. And here are a couple more pictures of those large circuit breakers. And that top picture is a zoomed out view of one of our switch yards. So this is the control room. You guys might be asking, how does someone control all of these devices in a hydro plant? There's a lot to work on. And yes, there is a ton to work on. You see this uh, picture from what I think is the 90s because of these giant bricks they have for monitors. Um, he has four monitors going, so he's monitoring a lot at the same time. Um, but the cool thing about control rooms is that as technology becomes more advanced, this is becoming less of a control room and more of a monitoring room. We even have plants that are completely remote operation that don't even require an operator to be there 24 seven. They operate from an else a site elsewhere. Uh, now, most plants are on the vertical or horizontal axis, but Harry S. Truman slant axis powerhouse decided to do it a bit different. I can't give you a reason why in the engineering world, but I can say that this is an engineering marvel. Uh, now, this is actually the first project I was a part of. As you can see on the top right, this is there's a void in the transformer, and that means there's a failure. Voids of transformers are not good because they're filled with oil. So as you can see in the bottom picture, all of these pads and um, things that were soaking up the oil, you can see the foam down here um, was cleaning up that huge mess the transformer had after it well, exploded. And you can see on the inside of the transformer, this is kind of the aftermath of the explosion. Now, luckily, we had a spare on site, so we replaced it. And all we had to do was bring it in using the jack and skid method, Teresa kind of covered earlier. I don't think, because of the bridge rails, you can't really see the um, uh, rails. But we used the jack and skid method. And I think the coolest thing about this project was the sheer amount of diversity that it took to replace the transformer as quickly as we did. Um, we had every type of engineer at HDC, but we also had environmental specialists and economists from HDC working on the project to make sure that we were on budget and on time and that we didn't do anything uh, to harm the river that we were working on. So at HDC, we get tons of exposure to all the other professions as well as our own. All right, thank you guys so much for listening. Are there any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Um, I My degree is mechanical engineering, so I, I'm only coming at it from like anecdotal standpoint, but it seems like electrical engineering is kind of trending towards ECE, like electrical and computer engineering, uh, as opposed to what I, used to imagine electrical engineering was, which is what you guys are talking about, big transformers. And, uh, you know, if you go up to the Grand Coulee Dam and they have those half million volt lines and the huge transformers and everything, and 
that's what I pictured. And then I talked to people and it seems like these days it's a lot of ECE where it's kind of computer hardware as well as uh, micro circuits and stuff like that. Is there really like a hard delineation between the two or is it all what you guys would call electrical engineering? Um, I'll start, I'll say for myself, actually at University of Portland, I think it was kind of similar where the classes that were pushed were more towards, you know, electronics. Um, I did have a couple of power and renewable energy classes. However, I think a big part of it is being able to like learn how to learn. So some of the things, you know, I did kind of have to come up to speed on the job and it was overwhelming at first, but those skills that you learn in college, um, even taking other like electronics classes maybe, do kind of transfer over to when you're learning things that are maybe more power oriented. Um, and this is kind of a theme I've heard with a lot of electricals, um, especially, you know, younger ones, newer engineers, where it does seem like classes are more pushed towards electronics. Um, but we, at least, you know, especially with the Army Corps and HEC have a really good training program that helped a lot. And like for me personally, I've always leaned more towards power systems because it just, and especially with HEC, it feels um, like providing a service for something that's kind of bigger than yourself. But I don't know if Cole had a similar experience. You can go ahead and answer also. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think I agree with a lot of what Teresa said. Um, there, academically, there's a lot of delineation between power systems and those microelectronics, the small little chips that are in your cell phone. Um, there, there's a pretty big difference between the two educationally, but I think in the field, it's very different because at the end of the day, it's still voltage, it's still current. You're still using copper. You're still using aluminum or gold or whatever we're using as a conductor, you're still using insulating material. Um, it's just at a different level. So again, for me at the end of the day, it's the same thing as microelectronic, microelectronics classes, but I'm just doing it at a larger scale. There's, there's things I use today in HDC um, that I learned in a microelectronics -electron class, which I never thought that would happen, but... <laughs> I work with exciters sometimes, like Teresa explained, and there's a concept called underdamped, overdamped, and critically damped. We use them all the time when we are calibrating exciters and uh, making sure they're putting the right voltage to those field poles. So, yes, there is a delineation um, uh, educationally, but it's like Teresa said, if you learn how to learn and you pay attention, you'll be able to apply anything you learn to anything and everything out in the field. Well, guys, thank you so much for presenting on this today. Um, I will get to Jeremy App's um, presentation. I'll close this out for the day. But thank you guys for, for presenting to us um, about electrical engineering. And good work avoiding using the exciter pun. <laughs> you know how much restraint I showed not to do that. <laughs> Missed opportunity. <laughs> yeah. uh, Brian um, Bell yesterday did not miss that opportunity, but he's a jack. Yeah. Um, one one more thing I just wanted to address, Michelle, you were very close on the air gap distance. I held a little pop quiz on earlier. The gap between the stator and the rotor is fractions of an inch, so one millimeter is pretty close. Thanks. Cool. Well, Jeremy, how is your mic working? I know there's always fun tech stuff that we get to deal with. Um, uh, have you tried um, Sounds like there might still be some issues with that. Oh, let me let me just take care of something real quick. Um, we actually 
I don't think the case has students on the line right now, so I will um, just pause this for a moment and uh, try to do some tech troubleshooting. Can you hear me, Michelle? I cannot hear you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I can hear you, Jeremy. Yeah, I can hear you too. Okay, somebody can hear me. All right. I have no idea if I'm talking to my phone or if I'm talking to the computer, but I'm just not going to touch anything. Okay. Oh, no. You're, it works, it works. Yeah. <laughs> uh, We can't see you though. Yeah. So if yeah. you pull up that picture of uh, Todd Routencraft again, I'll just tell everybody that I'm as handsome as that guy, and um, I, I'm I'm okay with that. Uh, I'm sorry. It's a brand new computer. The the video is the same setup. Sad story. I'm sorry. Um, I've had it for a week. Thought it was working, but. Apparently not. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's a little slider over the camera, like a little tab that you can move back and forth. So that might just be oh. close. There you are. Okay. Is the class on yet? Because I've got some choice words I want to. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. Jeremy, I will warn I was you. defeated by a time. I can't even see that thing. It would have taken me a month. To find that on my own. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we're in a bit of a weird thing. Uh, we had a, a late start, so we are between classes for the people who showed up. But we're okay. recording the session, so we're going to post it for classes to be able to move at their leisure. So 
there's no actual students, but we do have Colonel Wiley over at McKay High School uh, listening to us. Okay, so I'm presenting to Colonel Wiley. All right. All right, so you want to, you just want me to get on with it? Yeah, if you could share your slides, okay. that would be wonderful. So I will share, share contents. And we can have our PAO person edit out all of the technical issues. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So don't don't record yet. Uh, <clears throat> so I need to get myself in a different view here. Uh, I need to. Yeah. View, do I need? First, enable okay. content, then down at the bottom, there's the thing that looks like one of those pull down, not reading view, one to the right, slideshow. All right. Beautiful. Carry on with that. <clears throat> okay. So I'm presenting to a high, uh, high school class. All right. Not yeah. just a colonel, high school. All right, here we go. All right, go ahead, press record. Okay. Okay, guys. Um, today, Jeremy Apt, the section chief for the geotechnical, civil, and environmental design section at the Portland office is joining us. And he is going to um, talk with us about drilling at the Foster Dam uh, spillway drainage gallery. Uh, you can imagine uh, drilling is difficult even in the most open conditions, but being down inside the dam makes it even more interesting. So, Jeremy, thank you for joining us today. Uh, you're welcome, Michelle, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, and thank you to the class for this opportunity to uh, give back and hopefully inspire um, you all to learn more about uh, geotechnical engineering uh, and dam safety. So thank you very much. All right, so as Michelle said, foster IES drilling. All right? We're the Army, we love our acronym. Issue evaluation study is what that represents. So think capstone project for uh, spill, uh, for foster dam. Um, my name is Jeremy Apt. I have to give credit to uh, one of my uh, staff, uh, Natalie Ehrlich. Uh, she's the one who originally composed this presentation and I will try to uh, do her proud, okay. Uh, great photo here of Foster Reservoir and the dam with the uh, spillway front and center. Okay, we're gonna talk about the project location, the purpose of the drilling, the scope, methods, challenges, and the lessons learned. So <clears throat> Portland District uh, includes many drainage basins. Uh, one of the major ones is the Willamette, and that's outlined in green. I believe we've got 12 active dams in the Willamette, and one of those is Foster. Project location. So here's here's the Willamette Valley uh, highlighted, clipped out of that last drawing, and the big star is Foster Dam. So we are midway up the valley and draining water out of the Cascade Mountains. Uh, you can see some of those uh, foothills of the Cascades there in the uh, background of that uh, photo. The main features here, so you'll see uh, from left to right, you'll see Main Dam Embankment. Uh, you'll see the spillway, uh, which is uh, made out of concrete monolith. You'll see the transition zone dam embankment and the wing, wing dam embankment. So all those embankments are zoned earth structures <clears throat> with a concrete monolith spillway in the center. So the purpose of drilling, why are we drilling holes in the dam? Okay, it's kind of like 
why would you jump out of an airplane uh, working just fine? Well, some people like to parachute. No, that's just a joke. Uh, we are drilling in the dam because we are concerned about risk. And it was probably mentioned by some of the previous in, uh, presenters that a lot of these dams were built in early, uh, early last century, so 40s, 50s, 60s. And in some cases, uh, our knowledge of what drives risk and our knowledge of um, the mechanics, especially the soil mechanics, uh, what takes place inside a, a zoned earth embankment have, have improved greatly. Um, the 1940s is when soil mechanics uh, really first started being developed. And so now we're taking a hard look at how that plays with our risk, how, how is the function of a risk. So <clears throat> our dam safety program uh, performs semi-quantitative risk assessment SQRA uh, on a 10 year basis. And during that process, a team will get together and they will brainstorm and they will try to figure out what are all the probable failure modes? How could this dam possibly fail? And an example might be um, gate comes apart and you lose control of the, the, the spillway. Um, a, a, a break in the foundation underneath the zoned embankment uh, allows water to start piping through, those sorts of things. Those are all failure modes. And the team will select which ones are really driving the risk. Now, <clears throat> risk can be computed in many ways. The core computes it in several ways. Uh, probably the most common is average life lost. So the units of risk are life lost, and there's an annual probability of that average life, life lost. Um, and you'll, you'll notice this little figure on the right has uh, red lines, all right? So those are target risk guidelines. These are the ones we try to stay above and to the right of those lines. And those blue squares, well, those, those are indexed numbers, and, and they're the result of all that brainstorming. So one's highlighted there, probable failure mode number 28. Um, and will reducing those uncertainties help reduce the risk is, is the fundamental question. And there are many cases where, well, let me back up. Every, every measurement an engineer makes contains uncertainty. Doesn't matter if it's electrical, or if it's geotechnical or structural, it all contains uncertainty. And uncertainty is computed into that risk calculation. So if you can reduce the uncertainty in one of your parameters for stability uh, or potential loss of control of the reservoir, then you can actually bring down that estimated risk. And so that is why we're drilling at the dam. Um, yeah, in this particular case, we're trying to get more geotechnical uh, information. All right, so again, more of the purpose of the drilling earthquake. So here's a probable failure mode. Uh, imperative mood is the way this is, written. this is written. Earthquake leads to sliding instability of spillway monolith. I wonder, is that a haiku? That might even be a haiku. Leading to uncontrolled release of pool. Uh, key uncertainties for the structural modeling, all right? Quality of the rock concrete bond, the rock strength parameters, and the foundation material thickness. So you'll see you see a couple shades of pink here. So those are different layers of uh, uh, basalt rock. Uh, they've been broken apart by a shear zone that's running near vertical. Uh, that yellow highlighted portion is the monolith that we're worried about the movement on. Uh, there's a lot of science goes into uh, measuring and, and, and estimating friction properties for that sliding stability analysis. Uh, turns out if the rock is stronger than the concrete, uh, that bond between the rock and the concrete is actually about 10% of the undefined compressive strength of the concrete. Uh, but if it's if the rock is weaker than the concrete, then 
uh, you might be uh, looking at the shear zone between those two those two pink layers. All right, so drilling and testing scope. <clears throat> we had we went into the gallery and we drilled three angled and one vertical boring called a PQ boring. It comes from the mining industry. Um, I've long since forgotten what PQ stands for, but I do know it represents a three and three eighths inch diameter uh, drill bit. Um, and it produces a rock core that is three and three eighths inch diameter. So it's actually a little bit bigger on the outside diameter. Then we drilled uh, concrete cores using a, a different type of uh, coring, hole coring saw, and they produce four to six inch diameter cores. Um, and we did direct shear testing of the material contacts uh, at, the de at the discontinuity. Uh, we performed unconfined compressive strength testing of rock and concrete. You've probably seen some of that in your materials labs. Uh, we did flexure testing of concrete and used an optical televiewer down the hall uh, to map the rock discontinuities. And it actually produces a lovely uh, photograph unfolded. So it's a, it's a long uh, rectangle when you actually see the, the print of it. All uh, right. So this big white arrow is the drainage gallery entrance. Now, if you had any conceptions about what a drill rig looks like, uh, guess again, it's not what you're thinking. Oops. Excuse me, I seem to be lapping around. Okay, so here's a, here's a uh, elevation, a section view through the grouting and drainage gallery. So now we are down inside the model from the dam at this point. And these red arrows show the keystone cop pathway to get down the stairs and place our drill rig and drill these holes at the, at the red dots. And uh, the top half of the panel shows the um, top of hole and bottom of hole extents for each boring. And so we went through concrete, went through each of these ashy tough layers, so these are volcanic deposits, and all right, methods, you say, all right, so the Army Corps has uh, 34 districts, CONUS, six of which have drill rigs, and one of which has this specialized piece of equipment for getting down into tight, confined areas. So this is an electric drill rig uh, borrowed out of our Mobile district, that's Mobile, Alabama. And yeah, so they came all the way across the country to help us do this. And it was brand new equipment and they were excited to use it. So here it is all packaged up on a skid, uh, ready for transport down the, uh, down the gallery. Hooker by crook, uh, cables and winches, simple machines, you bet. We got her down the stairs. Here's the crew in action. But wait, there's more. Uh, this thing really does compact down into a tiny little rig. Uh, more equipment. Uh, this, ge this gentleman at the bottom of the stairs, I believe, Mr. Williams, he, he just retired last year, I believe. Uh, sure was great having him come out. Uh, here we are set up flat on the deck and ready to drill. And let the drilling begin. So most drill rigs require a whole team. So they usually have a couple operators and at least one person logging holes um, and another person uh, handling the samples and getting them ready to get shipped out. Often they are, you know, they, they've been buried for geologic time. Uh, usually we want to get them into wrapped up and in a cooler and off to the lab uh, toot sweet because uh, we don't want them to oxidize and they actually, uh, once, the, once they no longer feel that confining pressure, uh, their properties do change. So we wanna get them moving pretty quick. Um, it's just more pictures of confined, well, technically it doesn't, 
meet confined space. They didn't have to uh, pump any air or anything down here, but it was tight space. And uh, everybody had to get comfy. So those wooden boxes, top right hand, you'll see uh, those wooden boxes store the samples in. And so those are rock core samples being laid out. Usually take photos, uh, indicate with a uh, little uh, dry erase board to uh, collect metadata, you know, help us index and identify which samples which and where it belongs. Because uh, we'll be looking at these photos for, for years to come. All right, so now it's time for the optical televiewer. Uh, one of these borings is obviously outside, uh, but that's the, the camera equipment tethered to a cable and it heads on down the hall. And there's the, the logging that takes place um, along with the television on the right hand side. You can see clearly the contact between concrete and rock. The top panel, about halfway across it, you see the difference in colors, and then you can see the aggregate of the concrete uh, has been cut smooth. All right, so challenges and lessons learned. You say project staff are fantastic. When I say we were lucky to have uh, the folks from Mobile District come up and help us. Uh, a lot of challenges in access and safety. Uh, safety is paramount. Um, this gentleman uh, standing on one leg off the railing, uh, I'm sure there's a harness somewhere where we can't see and he's tied off. I'm sure of it. Um, uh, and the power of a written statement of work. So, you know. Even if you get your own family members to help you clean the house, sometimes communications can be a challenge. Right? So we had our own sister district come and, you know, you really do have to lay out the scope of work. Uh, a detailed document laying out the scope of work helps avoid misunderstandings, especially, which is important. I mean, they, they traveled a long way um, and they were here for a couple weeks, I believe. Um, Yes, you don't want to have a misunderstanding in the middle of all that. Uh, access and safety issues. And so ask yourself, what challenges do you see in these photographs? Um, well, safety. Somebody gets hurt, somebody's going to have to uh, get through this gallery in a hurry. Uh, they might even need uh, help getting through. There's a lot of equipment stacked there. You know, if you were hurt, you might actually have difficulty getting down that yeah, difficulty getting down that gallery. You know. uh, so there's there's worker safety, there's uh, just getting the job done. There's a picture of Natalie on the right, squeezing past the rig, trying to get the core boxes. You know, those things often weigh 50 pounds. You get a hoisted over your head. Uh, that's another story. Uh, what is missing in this photograph? And I have to admit when I saw this photo, I'm not exactly sure what's missing. Uh, I know you'd have trouble getting through there. Um, I'm sure everybody has safety goggles on. Um, maybe, they, maybe they should have their hard hats on. Yeah. Um, the uh, responsible person in charge uh, should be taking care of that. Okay, box sampling. All right, so Tough, tough classification, all right? So that's a, a play on words. Tough is a geologic term for a type of pyroclastic rock. And there's a uh, trilateral plot uh, that is used to classify those based off the different percentages of ash, blocks and bombs, or lapilli-sized uh, grains. And so that was part of the classification that needed to take place. And why is this important? Well, usually the uh, shear strength properties change with the type of pyroclastic rock. The drainage properties change. And those are all important to stability analysis. Rock sampling. Uh, so they really wanted to target that zone. Um, that they kind of sort of knew where it was, but you know, Every borehole is an adventure where you are still exploring to some degree. So they wanted to get a sample that would show that transition from concrete to ashy tough to sandy tough. And uh, it can be a real challenge uh, knowing those elevations uh, in advance because you're, you're standing there running a rig 30, 40 feet above. All right, so here's 
Here's pictures of them trying to classify in the core boxes. And the geologist would help log these cores. All right, the power of a written statement of work. All right. <laughs> now, this is in quotes. We didn't sign up for this. And I, I, so I presume it was somebody from Mobile District said, we didn't sign up for this. All right, so it's probably a good idea to always have some form of written and signed contract and a well-articulated work plan also in writing and approved even if we're using our own crew. All right, so no, we don't make contracts with our own crew, but we do have uh, a good written plan. Um, most, I believe we have a reg for all dam safety uh, projects, uh, DPP, drilling project plan. And that plan is supposed to get reviewed and approved and it should contain all the details uh, regarding the work required of the drill crew. Now, uh, work scheduling type stuff, that would all take place outside the DPP. Um, there's some other good quotes here. Uh, we will finish by Thanksgiving, all right. But what if, what is the plan if you don't? I mean, you got crews who want to go home to Alabama by Thanksgiving, all right. So we will finish by Thanksgiving. So that means working on Saturdays, working 10 hours a day, and suddenly the uh, local geologist is uh, Probably surprised, you know. Uh, they may not have been thinking uh, along those lines. All right, environmental controls. So don't assume the contractor will prioritize. So environmental controls. So dust, a water discharge. Every drill rig uh, makes noise. All those things uh, have best management practices, and in some cases, we actually need permits before we can uh, discharge any of those things. Uh, even if it's on our own property. Um, always spell out the requirement, get, get it in writing, check that they have appropriate BMPs on site before the work begins. All right, the power of written statement work. What is missing in this photograph? Sounds like we got a uh, pipe wrench over top of the uh, core, coring uh, uh, shoe and Frankly, I don't know what's missing from this photograph. And I'll have to ask Natalie. Probably a tool to remove that from the hole that gets gets jammed, my hunch. Um, okay, final thoughts. Rock quality was generally much better than expected. The cores were intact, so near full recovery. And one of our measurements for that is called a rock quality uh, designator. It's an index. So there's very few mechanical breaks. So the drill rig itself didn't break the rock. The laboratory results uh, says they're not in yet. Well, this presentation is old. They are in. Uh, laboratory results were very good. Uh, there's a good concrete bond. So there was no voids between the concrete and the rocks. That means they cleaned it really well before they placed that concrete. Uh, the televiewer validated uh, the contact elevations in the field logs. So we now have more confidence of what was logged in the field during construction 80 years ago. Uh, more flexibility with the USACE crews. Um, that is kind of a complicated subject. Uh, sometimes we do contract with uh, consulting firms and the terms of those contracts tend to be a little more stringent than with our in-house crews. Uh, Acquisition is faster. Um, okay, this is another, uh, some more in-house business. Uh, the contracting process does take a little time, usually about three months from the time we declare a need uh, and prepare a statement of work to when we actually have a contract with a consulting firm. Um, now those six, six districts, uh, we don't have that additional contracting process, but you know, they're, they're limited resources. Well, uh, we don't always get them when we want them. Uh, and apparently there must be an inside joke here. Not all drillers appreciate Donna. Uh, no, I sure do. Um, is there anything left? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I can tell you that, I'm gonna go back to final thoughts. So, Back to where this all started was risk. Uh, we did reduce the uncertainty. The risk was recomputed. The risk went down. 
Um, and that is a success story because we now have more information. All right, thank you all very much. Uh, I hope you're inspired. Uh, there's lots of opportunities uh, in geotechnical and dam safety engineering in Portland districts and really around the country. Uh, and if you thought about coming to Portland district to do this type of work, uh, and I was your supervisor, I would almost uh, insist on uh, having you travel around the core and see other districts and uh, get exposed to a lot of different projects that are out there. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Well, thank you for joining us, Jeremy. Um, so I don't think there's going to be any questions, um, so I'll let us go for the day. But thank you for coming out here and uh, doing this presentation for us. Like, that does get to, um, I would say geotechnical engineering is one of the less comfortable sorts of engineering because there is a lot of time spent handling cores from a drill rig. It's very less hands-on and very enjoyable. I know you enjoy the work that you do. Thank you for saying so. Appreciate that. Okay, well, hopefully the uh, students get to enjoy that at some point. Um, well, thank you. Have a wonderful day. Me too. Thank you. And thank you for helping me uh, find that little slider thing. Boy, that was that was a big find for the day. Oh, no problem. <laughs> yeah, we, you can learn from anyone, even me. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Thanks for hosting.